Distance of God is, in my view, a very fundamental one, and it will lead me to talk about the question of why I think secular humanism, even if it's intellectually plausible, is morally and humanly a disaster for the human race. Um, the moral argument is that when we look at a work of scripture, uh, you know, whether it's the Quran, which is a very homogeneous and short scripture by the way, compared to the Bible, and also it has the distinction of being reliably associated with somebody in known history. I mean, without the founders of faiths, it's mostly legend, I think. Uh, Paul, I think, is the first person to grow up in the full light of history. Other founders of faiths, the Buddha certainly we're not sure about. Muhammad in, indisputably grew up in real history because there are Byzantine records contemporary with him. So we know that he was a real person and what he brought was a book that can be reliably associated with him. Now the question is when such a book comes which essentially critiques two existing monotheisms and also critiques the pagan uh, Arabs of the day, on what basis should one believe such a work? I mean nowadays if somebody in a sheet and sandals said to you that you'd heard from God, I think your reaction would be that he was suffering from dementia or that he had some kind of mental illness. No one would take him seriously. Is that a fair assumption? So how is it that anybody at any stage in history was able to get away with making such claims? Now, of course, it didn't happen overnight, but I think it's something to do with our assessment of the moral credentials, both of a person and of the message, but of the person as well. By the way, am I fine for time? Um, yeah, go about another one, 20 minutes. Yeah, thanks. So, in terms of deductive mathematical truths, we try and prove 2 plus 2 equals 4, quadrat demonstrandum, we use a certain method. How do we know if someone makes a claim of a metaphysical kind, it doesn't have to be supernatural, even if somebody makes a claim such as, I'm your friend, why should one believe that? I love you, for example, to use a human relationships. How do we assess these claims, their validity, their, their veracity? Um, clearly not a mathematical method is used. We don't use the mathematical method that the logical empiricists want to impose upon all types of knowledge. Obviously there's knowledge other than scientific and mathematical where we do not use that method. We use some other method for aesthetic judgments, moral judgments, personal judgments. And I think that that model is the perfect virtue of the human personality. I think that if we find a person with perfect virtue, it's a model that Christians will be sympathetic with too then what that person says is prima facie got a certain claim to being true. I think we use that method with people as well when we're dealing with other human beings, whether to trust them or not. We do assess what else is trustworthy and reliable about them in general before we look at the particular claim they're making which we're assessing. So the Islamic method would be that if Muhammad lived life of perfect obedience to God and virtue, then the things he brought, even if some of which were counterintuitive to the pagan Arabs of the time, then it must be true. Now, I agree that there are incommensurable models here because, of course, that could be used of another person, like, say, the Buddha, who comes with an equal amount of virtue in his life, and therefore the system associated with him called Buddhism is equally true. And it's not really my, uh, it's not really my argument that Islam is uniquely true in this regard, only that it is likely to be partly true, and that if it is partly true, then other related rival religions are also partly true. I mean, it's a more modest claim, uh, rather than simply saying that you know, one particular religion has absolute priority. But I should add that I do not speak here as an imam or the leader of my community. I'm not, we have no clergy in Sunni Islam, which is my religion, Orthodox Islam. Shiite Islam has a clergy where people speak ex cathedra. I, I simply speak as someone with my own opinions on the subject. So the moral argument would be that not only that in assessing the validity of scripture in, inside history, we have to look at the virtue of the person bringing it, but also I think something that may be valid, this is Kant's argument, Immanuel Kant, that the, in order to do justice to the moral consciousness that we have as human beings, we need a God. I mean, his idea was that we needed freedom of the will, we needed immortality of the soul, and we needed an all-powerful all God. Why did we need an all-powerful God? For one very compelling reason. If there is no God to align um, virtue with happiness and vice with misery, then some people die uh, with the knowledge that they have essentially cheated the moral consciousness. So many people who are tyrants and evildoers will die and will not be brought to justice or to account. Does that thought by the trouble you sometimes you look at some of these politicians glibly talking on TV, justify themselves in front of home, human audiences? You think they've had plenty of practices in this world. I hope they'll do just as well on the Day of Judgment 
where they're standing in front of God justifying some of their actions. Does it trouble you morally that some people will, in fact, 